Hi, it's Steve. Today is day 20 of my 30 days of video series and water fasting at the same time. Uh, I can't believe I made it to day 20 already with no food, so I'm happy to be two-thirds of the way done with that. Interestingly, last night I had a dream that I was at this Italian restaurant, pasta place, and there was food everywhere, and I didn't eat anything, even in the dream, because I remembered I was fasting. So that really sucks. <laughs> um, in fact, I remember like when I first went vegan, sometimes like in the first year or two, I would have dreams of eating animal products. But then after a while, I would never eat animal products in my dreams. Like I would always be 100% vegan in my dreams too. So sometimes I'd even check if the dream food was vegan, if you can believe that. Um, but uh, today was kind of weird because my energy physically was like really low. I just really sluggish all day, I took an extra nap. Um, and uh, just kind of being, you know, feeling really physically lethargic and lazy. But mentally, my mind was pretty good and sharp, and I was able to get lots of work done. It felt like I was in this lower energy state the whole day, though. Uh, so, oh, you know, it was kind of weird. I felt like I wasn't going to have a very productive day necessarily. But once I got sitting at my desk, and I didn't have to move around much, I was able to plow through a whole bunch of work. So that was, that was not too bad. But it really, like, the work I did mentally really drained me. And, like, by... Around 6 p.m., my mind was just fried, and I just felt like, you know, I could barely think, and I was starting to get a headache, so I was like, okay, I'm done for the day with this. And then I still had to do a video. So to take it a little bit easy on myself, I decided to, like, do a video based on um, a 2005 article I wrote uh, about uh, when to leave a long-term relationship, and because uh, I just wasn't feeling particularly creative. So this is like a video version of that article. Um, one other symptom of the of the uh, of the detoxification and the um, the fasting I noticed that just came in like I just noticed it I think yesterday or Rochelle noticed it as I'm starting to get a bit of a rash on my chest it's pretty mild that's a very common symptom of detox um, usually goes away in a few days and uh, common symptom of fasting so I'm not particularly worried about that it's just another you know your skin is another detoxification pathway so that's all pretty common and normal. Um, otherwise, nothing all that unexpected on the fast so far, still going relatively smoothly. And uh, all right, let's get on to the, the topic. So this, um, this article is, is somewhat based on a book I read uh, many years ago by Mira Kirschenbaum, and it's called Too Good to Leave, Too Bad to Stay. Of all the books I've recommended in my blog, I would definitely say this is one of the top three in terms of the amount of feedback I've gotten from people who've bought this book and read it and have gotten great benefits from it. Like it gives you tons of clarity. And what's unique about this book is that it's a diagnosis for your relationship. So if you're in a long-term relationship and you're in the state of ambivalence, ambivalence means you're not sure whether you should stay in the relationship or leave. It's like you're constantly oscillating back and forth, you know, vacillating in your mind. It's like, you know, what do I do? Um, do I leave this relationship? Do I stay? Maybe you leave for a while and then you come back and it's like constantly, you know, on again, off again. You're not really sure what you're doing. <laughs> um, and the cool thing about this book is it basically has around 50 questions or so you ask. And this is all based on people um, that um, Amira Kirschenbaum uh, basically uh, did, um, you know, in her, I think she had a, a psychology or psychiatry practice of some sort. I think, they, I think she was a psychologist or a relationship counselor of some sort. And all the people she was, um, you know, giving therapy to and counseling and coaching and so on, she would see who left the relationship for certain reasons and who stayed in the relationship that had those same factors. And basically over years of doing this, like which people ended up happier. So if you have one certain factor, um, like you don't respect your partner and you stay in the relationship, are you better off staying in the relationship with a partner you don't respect? Because on the other side, you're not gonna be as happy because now you're alone or you're not gonna find any better. Or is that a good enough reason to leave? And so the book, basically identifies in no uncertain terms, here are the good enough reasons to leave because generally speaking, people will be happier on the other side when they, when they leave. It'll be a difficult transition, but it's really good to know that other people in your shoes who did leave under those circumstances were happier for it. And then it also makes clear like, that other situations may be more trivial and you're making a mountain out of a, out of a molehill and you shouldn't necessarily leave just for that reason because you'll probably regret it later because you might have a pretty good relationship 
and you're just blowing things up, up too much and making it an excuse to leave and that's not a good enough reason to leave. So um, I kind of compiled, you know, some of them I just feel are, are really out there. It just seems obvious to me, but of course some of these things are not obvious to everyone. So I, I compiled a list of, uh, you know, some of the top reasons to leave. Some of the ones that seem obvious to me, and this may not be obvious to you, is like if you're in a relationship with a drug addict, duh, you leave. <laughs> um, I know when you're in that, it seems not obvious, but to everybody else around you, it's obvious that it's a dead situation. You know, if you're in a relationship with an addict, you're also in a relationship with their addiction, and that's just gonna drag everybody down. And you need to get clear of that relationship and you know, help the addict if you want from outside the relationship or let them work through that on their own. But to me, that's just a no-brainer. To some people, that's a tough situation though. So I'm not gonna share ones that I think are just like, you know, a fairly intelligent person is just gonna go, duh. Um, so I'll share some of the, some of the trickier ones. Um, so the first one is if you're religious and you're staying in the relationship purely for the sake of the religion. Like if it wasn't for your religion or your belief that God will punish you or something, um, then it would just be obvious that you should leave. Like there's so many issues, it's just like, okay, it's clear I would leave, but I'm worried about you know, my religion or a religious judgment or something like that. People are just happier if, if they, even if they violate their religion just to get out of that kind of relationship. If it's a dead relationship with a religion, it's a dead relationship without one. So don't re let religion alone be the excuse for staying. You've gotta have many more reasons to stay. And if that's the only reason you're staying, that's all you're clinging to, you're better off leaving. People will be happier if they leave for that reason. Um, number two, you can't get your needs met in the relationship. So you have certain needs that you know you really want, you need certain things from your partner, whatever it is, emotional support. You wanna have somebody to talk to at the end of the day, somebody who really cares about you. You need affection, um, you need sex, like whatever it is. And you just feel like this relationship is not giving you what you really need from a partner. Move on. <laughs> That's, you know, that seems clear. That can be a tricky one because you have to, you know, identify what exactly it is that you need and is this a real need. Um, but if it's something you're constantly craving and it's just giving this feeling of emptiness and you just feel like, um, you know, you're constantly getting clingy with your partner, trying to get your need met from them and you're negotiating and stuff like that, that's time to move on. Because a partner who really respects your needs and has similar needs um, and has a compatible love strategy, it's much easier to get your needs met. So, you know, it's like they will meet your needs almost automatically, almost effortlessly. And, uh, you know, being in that kind of relationship myself where my needs are met really easily, I, it's, you know, I just wouldn't want to go back to one where it's like this clingy feeling, like you're trying to claw your needs from the other person. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, you want to be in that place where your needs are met fairly easily. It shouldn't be a monumental effort to get your needs met. If that's the case, move on and find somebody more compatible. Um, number three, mutual like. You both like each other. I mean, this is a little bit of an Odell one, but some people end up in long-term relationships and they fall out of like with their partner. Not talking about being in love, but do you actually like your partner as a human being? If, you know, is your partner a good friend to you? If your partner is not even a good friend to you, and you don't actually like the person anymore, you, know, you see this a lot in like couples that have been married for a long time. Like if you've seen the TV show, Everybody Loves Raymond, you know, Raymond's parents, <laughs> they clearly don't like each other. <laughs> um, so it's like, why stay together in that situation? Don't stay in a relationship with somebody you don't like or who doesn't like you. Number four, having a unique sexual attraction for your partner. So this is, you know, this is not just like a general sexual attraction, but there's something about that person that you're just like, wow, it's like your sexual chemistry with that person is unique. It's different. It's something special that you two share that you don't just have with any random stranger. So if you don't have that kind of situation, people that leave for that reason to find a partner that they really do have unique sexual chemistry with, they're happier. And, you know, it's not to say you can't have sexual chemistry with a lot of different people but you should at least have some kind of unique vibe, you know, unique sexual connection with your partner that's different than everyone else. That helps create stronger bonds. Number five, uh, when your partner has unacceptable behaviors or habits, like things your partner does that just annoy the heck out of you and you just, you're just like trying to tolerate it, but you don't really like it. And your partner is not willing to change 
or they're willing to change, but they just can't seem to get their act together and make the change. You know, give them like three months, six months to get their act together if you want to be generous. Um, I think 30 to 90 days is plenty for, for changing habits that are just like deal breakers to the relationship. But ask yourself, if this, um, if this negative habit or behavior that's bothering you continued for the entire relationship and they were never going to change, you know, would you still want to be in that relationship? If the answer is no, then, you know, just like say, okay, you got like a few months to change this, otherwise I'm out of here. And there's, you know, and no relapsing. <laughs> it's like, just get this over with and, and get out if, it, if they're not gonna change. Um, you know, give them, give them any help they need, give them support, but if they're not gonna change, you know, move on. This is something you can do with an addict too, but it really, really rarely works, um, giving them an ultimatum, because then the addict will just talk you back into it and they'll, you know, or they may start hiding things from you. Uh, that's, you know, not necessarily the best situation to use an ultimatum with an addict. Better to just recognize the addiction is, it can be more powerful than the relationship and move on and, you know, try to help them from the outside if you still want to help. Um, but yeah, unacceptable ha habits and behaviors, it's not a reason to stay. It's not something you need to tolerate. If you're tolerating your partner, that's, that's not enough compatibility. Um, okay, so number six is having really high compatibility in your partner such that you can see yourself in your partner to a large extent. Rochelle and I definitely have that. Like we're, we're definitely birds of a feather. We have just such oddities and quirks of our personality. We just get along really well together. And for one, we've both been um, long-term vegans. Um, so, you know, when we, like that is a huge amount of compatibility. When I see, you know, look into her eyes, I see a fellow vegan, somebody who shares my values. Uh, we both love traveling. You know, there's like so many things that we have in common, um, you know, both being into personal growth and so on. Uh, we both blog. I do a lot more often than she does, but it's like a, a shared interest. We both love independent theater. That's something she got me into because uh, she's a playwright and an actress. So having a lot of, a lot of compatibility is really, really important. Uh, it's, you know, love alone is not quite enough. You really want to have like at least 80% compatibility with your partner, where like your interests align really closely. That's, that's just so important. And if you and your partner are just kind of like always going off in different directions, you'd be happier with somebody that you can share all those activities with. So consider, you know, maybe it's time to move on. Number seven is mutual respect. So this is not just liking your partner, but actually respecting them. And respecting your partner as a, as a human being, um, especially professionally, is that, you know, there's something about your partner that you can respect. Do you, do you like their skills, their talents? Or do you admire them in some way? If there's no admiration in you for your partner and you kind of just see them as a bit of a loser, you'll be happier with somebody that you do respect. Number eight, is your partner a resource for you in some way? This doesn't necessarily mean financially, but a resource for you in some way you care about. It could be something really simple. Rochelle and I can be resources for each other in many different ways. But one of the ways I like that she's a resource for me is she's a way better cook than I am. <laughs> and, um, you know, I really love her cooking and I totally miss it when she's out of town. And so it can be something really simple. But like if, if the idea of the, your partner is a resource for you means that if you left that relationship, you would lose something that you really care about. Like if I could never eat Rochelle's cooking again, I would be sad. <laughs> that would be like, oh no, I, like, I want her to make this or I want to make that. And she enjoys cooking for us. So I really, really appreciate that about her. So what is it about your partner that you really appreciate um, that you see that, you know, see your partner as a resource for you? Are they a financial resource? Are they a great conversationalist? Uh, conversationalist? Are they a great cuddler? You know, it's like, do they meet your emotional needs? It's like, what is it that you feel um, is, is really valuable in the relationship that you would miss if your partner left. And a good, you know, a good way to test this is like if your partner goes on a trip and is out of town for a while, what do you miss about them? Do you not miss them at all? If you don't miss them at all and there's nothing you miss about that, then maybe they're not as big a resource for you as you, as you really deserve. So, you know, it, it, it really is helpful in a relationship where you guys, you know, with both people combine resources and they can make each other stronger as a couple than they are as individuals. Number nine, having a capacity for forgiveness. If you guys can never forgive each other, that's a problem. Cheating in a relationship, you might be wondering about that one. Like, why haven't I mentioned that one yet? 
Cheating in a relationship by itself is not necessarily a reason to leave. It's a reason to leave, though, if there's no capacity for forgiveness, if the cheating cannot be forgiven, if the dishonesty in the cheating cannot be understood. Sometimes it's not the cheating that's the biggest issue, it's the dishonesty and the cover-up afterwards and the denial about that. Um, and sometimes people are a bit, you know, codependent where they just sort of like get into this denial phase where they both know there's cheating happen, uh, happening and they just don't bring it to the surface. And I think that's partly because nobody wants to take a risk that forgiveness might not be possible. So, um, you know, or like on both sides. So, you know, that, that's, uh, that's a really important one is just having a capacity for, to forgive. If, the, if any little slight just seems to keep damaging your relationship and putting more and more dents in it, um, it's just gonna basically kind of reach a boiling point and it's not going to let off steam. You need a way to let off steam. You need a way to say, I'm sorry. Even if it's a little thing, it's good to say, I'm sorry. Number 10 having fun together. So do you enjoy each other's company? Do you have fun together? Go out on dates or whatever it is you enjoy for fun. Cuddling up and watching a movie together. You know, it can be something simple, traveling together, whatever it is, but you know, do you have some kind of fun together? If there's no fun in your relationship at all, if it's just kind of, you know, going through the motions each day, people in those situations are happier when they leave and they find a partner who, you know, puts the fun back in their life. That's one of the main reasons people cheat, is like having a partner that gives them all the attention they, they want and they crave, meets their needs, and amps up the fun. And it's like you have all this fun. And then now it's like creates a lot of attraction. So having fun in a relationship, really big deal. That's been a huge part of my relationship with Rochelle, is having you know, sometimes over the top crazy amounts of fun. Like last year when we went to Disneyland for 30 days in a row as a bit of a personal growth experiment. And it was a lot of fun. It was just like us hanging out all day. I was kind of surprised we didn't get bored with it by the end. Uh, it was just like every day was a bit different and we just kept mixing it up and finding new ways to make the experience fresh. But it was just that, you know, us going out, doing some crazy experiment together, spending all our time together every day outside. That was wonderful. Is it, you know, that sort of thing, big part of our relationship. Um, and the last one, number 11, having mutual goals and dreams for the future. One sign you see in relationships that are a bit damaged or going downhill is that one partner stonewalls, or even both of them stonewall, when it comes to making any kind of plan for the future. So that's a sign that somebody's kind of thinking about, you know, leaving, or they're not wanting to commit anymore to the relationship. It doesn't have to be a huge commitment, but things like planning trips together. You know, like, can you plan a trip together? Can you plan things a few months out in advance? Uh, you know, I'm not saying this criteria has to be like you're planning out your entire lives together, you're planning years ahead, but are you setting some goals together for things you would like to do? Do you talk about things you'd like to experience together? Trips you'd like to take, um, you know, goals you'd like to achieve. What is, you know, what is that? Uh, how does that show up in your relationship? Is it present? If it's not present, that's kind of a bad sign. If you can't make any kind of goals and plans for the future with your partner, like even just a little bit ahead, a few months ahead, that's, you know, that's kind of dead. And it, you'd probably be better off and be happier with somebody who can plan with you, who can, um, you know, set goals mutually together as a couple. And it just, it creates more bonds between you. Uh, one bonus thing I'll share, which I didn't share in the original article, is that there are two interesting signs when somebody's about to leave a relationship. And I've read a lot of books about about breakups and things as I was studying relationships, especially in preparation for the Conscious Relationships workshop that I did back in 2012. And an interesting thing is that, and these are both sort of common sense, they, they'll make a lot of sense, but the first one is that people who are about to break up often get really into fitness in a way they haven't been before. It's not a breakup sign if your partner's always been into fitness and they just keep being into fitness or they amp up their workouts to get fitter when they've already been doing that. But if it's a person who hasn't been into fitness for a long time and suddenly they start going to the gym and really working on their fitness, that's a hint and a half <laughs> that they're thinking about leaving. It's not 100% a sign, of course, not even, you know, not even close to 100%, but it is definitely one of those signs, uh, one of the common things that people get into. Um, I know somebody who you know, suddenly was getting into fitness a lot and sure enough, divorce is coming up. <laughs> uh, you know, not too much of a surprise when that happens. 
Um, it's just a very common thing. And it's like we, in our minds, we say, oh, I want to get fit for, you know, get myself in shape so I can be out there and, and uh, you know, be ready for new partners before you even leave the relationship. I don't know if it's the best thing to do, you know, in terms of honesty and all that, but, you know, it is a common factor. The second thing that often shows up, and this is not necessarily something that people do deliberately, is they end up making a lot of new friends that, doesn't, that don't include their partner. So they end up creating some kind of new social circle. And oftentimes what happens is they share some aspects of their relationship, that, which may be on the rocks already, with that new social circle. And it's the social circle that often encourages them to leave the relationship. Or they meet some other potential partners through that social circle, and they start thinking, oh, okay. You know, and if, if, uh, if you find yourself in that situation where you're getting in a social circle and you're not even admitting to the people that you're in a relationship already, that's another hint that you're thinking about leaving. Uh, but, you know, getting into some new social circle often makes you see yourself differently. It can often shed light on a damaged, broken relationship because the new people will often treat you with more respect and they might even like you more than your partner does. And if you start seeing that, you just think, what am I doing in this relationship that's like dragging me down when these new friends are so great? And like, they like me as I am, they see me as I am, they encourage me in things in ways my partner doesn't, and you start craving the things those new, fr those new friends are giving you, but in an even deeper way with intimacy added onto it too. And so that's another um, pattern of leaving relationships. And when people leave relationships, you know, for all these other reasons, again, they are generally happier on the other side. If you, if you haven't read it yet, I highly recommend, if you're in a long-term relationship or you're in that place of ambivalence, uh, read Mary Kirschenbaum's book, Too Good to Leave, Too Bad to Stay. It's really excellent. It's, I think it'll tremendously open your eyes to relationships um, and just like, you know, how they end and when to end them in a way that's intelligent and that makes sense. It's almost like a medical diagnosis for your relationship. The cool thing about it is that even if you're not ready to leave right away, it's a huge dosage of truth. It'll show you the factors that are working, working for you. Like when I, when I um, you know, read this book while I was in my relationship with my now ex-wife, there were four flags, you know, four things I didn't pass. And the book basically says, if you don't even pass, if there's one of these things that you don't pass, you'll be better off leaving. And I had four of them, so I was like, oh. And sure enough, I am happier on the other side. It's, it's like, you know, the book is just golden. But when I read the book, it took me years to come to, fa come to terms with that, to really be, be able to believe that. I had to go through like a polyamory phase first of exploring with other partners, and it was like, it was not easy. Because it's like, you can get really invested in a long-term marriage, and, you know, especially when you have kids. It's, it's uh, definitely not an easy decision, the longer your relationship goes, you know, to leave it. Um, so I definitely uh, sympathize with people who are in that kind of situation, and just how gut-wrenching gut wrenching it can be to, to have to go through that kind of experience. But I can tell you, you know, being one of the people on the other side too of that type of situation, that it definitely is better on the other side. And the thing that almost everybody says is it was hard, really difficult maybe, but it was worth it. And that's, that's so true. It's like if you, if you really wanna have a healthy relationship life um, and relationships, you know, it's been said are about 80% of your happiness in life you have to keep your standards up and you can't start you know, getting sucked down into ambivalence and where you're just like not sure whether you should stay or go. You wanna be in a relationship where it's just obvious that you belong together and that you should stay with each other because it's to your mutual benefit and you like each other and you respect each other. And you have a unique sexual attraction and all those other benefits. So don't, you know, don't get clingy or stuck uh, for too long if you could avoid it with a relationship that's setting off you know, one or more of these warning flags. So, you know, give this some food for, you know, give this some thought. It's just meant as some food for thought if you're in this kind of relationship. And if not, it's good to be aware of these things even before you get into a relationship because you can use this as a diagnosis even early on to see if the relationship is a good match for you because you might see some of these things right out the get-go that you're like, oh, we're not going to be a good match long-term and you might want to avoid going too deep. All right, so if you haven't, you know, gotten the book, please check it out. It's really awesome and I'll see you tomorrow.